Good morning, everyone. And I would just like to thank everyone who show up early this morning on a rainy Saturday morning. I thank uh, uh, both Nick and uh, Paul to, uh, to chair this session. So, um, as what Paul mentioned, I will be uh, telling you about the various work that uh, my team has been working on over the last 20 months together with uh, many colleagues here in Singapore and uh, is to read on how we uncover various interesting questions on the infection and immunity of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So I think many of you will know me uh, and my earlier work at the Singapore Immunology Network um, and just a little bit of uh, history on uh, Singapore's uh, um, timeline against infectious diseases. So since 2003, I guess Singapore has sort of uh, re-looked at the way we should be uh, studying uh, various infectious diseases after the um, uh, SARS. And of course, we had uh, episodes of uh, avian H5N1 uh, that although Singapore was not directly affected, but we were involved in various ways. And uh, of course, we had the 2006 7 uh, chikungunya outbreaks, which was at the time I uh, started my research uh, program as well. Um, so right now, we are already uh, almost the end of uh, 2021. We are still living with COVID. And uh, I hope that uh, what I'll be sharing with you this morning and also later with, uh, from uh, Antonio, it will give you uh, various uh, perspectives from the kind of uh, work that we have been working on. So I was mentioning, uh, I think many of you will know me uh, from my Singapore immunology days, but over the last uh, one and a half years, as part of the uh, uh, transformation or rather reorganization that uh, ASTAR has been um, embarking, uh, they sort of uh, rearrange or re uh, right side of various research teams in the various uh, um, uh, research entities. And as a result, uh, there was the establishment of the uh, ASTAR Infectious Diseases Labs to look at uh, preparedness. So in terms of the uh, various uh, pillars, uh, the focus is going to be on uh, vector borne diseases, antimicrobial resistance, uh, respiratory diseases, and how are we able to understand the various mechanisms of uh, bacterial pathogenesis, viral pathogenesis, and uh, um, of course, different questions on infection and immunity, and are we able to uh, repurpose some of this knowledge, tools, and even platforms uh, during pandemic uh, situation. So in terms of uh, COVID-19, as I mentioned, for the past 20 years, uh, 20 months, uh, we have been working very closely together with our colleagues here in Singapore, uh, mainly led by the NCID, uh, together with NUS, Duke NUS, uh, NUH, and also NTU to look at um, uh, that falls under this umbrella, uh, this study called PROTECT. So effectively, it is a multi-center study uh, that aims to um, detect novel pathogens and also characterize emerging infections. So over at ASTAR, ID Labs, Singapore Immunology Network, and also together with um, Duke and NUS, uh, NUHS, uh, the aim is to look at uh, use various approaches to understand uh, infection and immunity, and so specific uh, uh, um, uh, the establishment of uh, various assays, such as uh, some serological assays or even other detection assays, uh, as uh, listed here. So the use of uh, multiplex cytokine profiling to understand some of the uh, immune signatures. Also, we make use of high-dimensional immune phenotyping through flow or the cytof and, and so on and so forth. Now, the questions that we were asking, not just clinically, is are we able to identify any uh, underlying mechanisms of severe disease progression? Because nothing was known in the early days. From there, are we able to identify biomarkers that was related to diagnosis or even prognosis of a severe COVID-19. Any specific immunodominant neutralizing B-cell epitopes? We have heard from a Professor Lin Fa Wang on Thursday, you know, on his uh, approach to, to establish the CPAS. So, so of course, uh, what we have done was uh, different, but it in a way complements the larger uh, study. And uh, uh, that leads us to the point four, the, the monitor of the uh, antibody responses 
through some flow cytometry assay. So coming to um, one of the very common uh, questions that everyone was asking uh, in the early days and even until now was um, the involvement of a cytokine storm upon SARS-CoV-2 infection. And what was the profile or the signatures like in some of these patients from mild disease to severe disease? Do they have the same profile or are we able to look at them uh, differently? So back then, uh, with the first uh, cohort of patients uh, last year, in early last year when we had the first uh, outbreak, so with uh, NCID and the other hospitals, the clinicians were able to categorize the disease into three different uh, uh, categories. So the, mostly the mild patients, which we classify them as uh, the mild without any pneumonia, and the more severe patients, which is pneumonia with, uh, without hypoxia, and the more severe uh, group of patients um, that you know, needed uh, oxygen, and even some of them ended up in ICU. So you could look at this uh, two-way cluster analysis. Just based on the cytokines uh, analysis, you'll see that the uh, pro-inflammatory signature actually get more pronounced in terms of uh, the disease severity. So clearly, essence of a cytokine storm. And David uh, already uh, uh, explained, uh, yes, in his talk yesterday, and through all these efforts, you know, the kind of the various um, uh, um, uh, therapeutic uh, approaches that the clinicians had embarked on. So one of them was actually to target the IL-6. And from the same group of patients, we were following them last year. And uh, this was the study where uh, we looked at their profiles on six months. And uh, right now, of course, the same group of patients, some of them are still with us in the 18 months uh, study. But you could see here that uh, what we've seen in the file, uh, in, in the slides earlier, that uh, during the early acute infection, of course, you have the uh, very uh, um, the, the high um, uh, the intense uh, uh, signatures of the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. But as the disease progresses into one month, three months, and even up to six months, you will see that actually most of these uh, inflammatory markers have uh, subsided by then. But what was uh, interesting is that when we uh, reanalyzed these patients uh, by uh, a PCA analysis, just based on their uh, uh, severity at the early uh, uh, stage, you could see from here that uh, even though they have already um, recovered, but uh, they actually separate out quite uh, nicely from those uh, uh, the controls, people who were not infected. So I think this is something to look at as we are uh, analyzing the, the 12 months and the 18 months uh, 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 group. So moving on, so another part that we were looking at was, okay, based on the cytokine responses, it then led us to look at uh, what are the immune cell types that would be, uh, that have a very significant role in the early uh, infection. So at that time, with the uh, close collaboration with NCID and TTSH, we were, uh, and also NPHL, we were able to uh, get a cohort of the acute patients where uh, we did um, a deep flow analysis just from their blood. And the intention was to look at the profiles of the specific immune subsets uh, during uh, the time when they are mostly uh, viremic. And you could see from here, uh, from the acute uh, patients, you see a very clear differences in terms of the patterns compared to the healthy and uh, also the same group of patients who have recovered after uh, two months. And uh, what we found at that time was the uh, increased expression of the CD169 and also the increased expression of the CD11B. And these are again uh, are signatures of uh, pro-inflammation. And uh, when we then proceeded with a heat map representation, uh, we found that uh, there was a high degree of um, markers that represent uh, monocyte activation, as you could see from here. Uh, and also, uh, I will say that uh, it is not unexpected, but we were uh, hoping to look at uh, specifically at also the neutral fields uh, population. And you could see very clearly that the acute patients also showed a significant upregulation 
of the neutrophil activation markers. Now, what happens after when we had a larger uh, pool of uh, patients that we collected? So you could see from here that um, by looking at the neutrophils uh, population, we were able to actually discriminate between um, the uh, acute patients with uh, and, and and also the, the and and how the 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 profile look like after they have recovered, and when we just zone uh, zoom in into the specific immature neutrophil uh, subset, which is actually represented by the uh, CD sixteen low high and CD ten negative, you could see that's the um, it's very significant. The difference is very clear. So the question was, would this be a useful prognostic marker in the early days when the patient comes in by remake? you get a small uh, amount of blood and you run through the flow. And are we able to use this to be able to uh, differentiate if, this, uh, the, if, if, if the patients would actually be severe or not? So this could be another uh, form of um, approach to use that could help clinical management. So using the same approach, we then uh, also recruited at the second part of last year, we were able uh, to recruit another group of patients, what we call the asymptomatic patients, which were, were PCR uh, positive, but actually were uh, had no symptoms. And this could be the con people who were, who were living close by or uh, in the same household with the confirmed cases. So using the same approach to focus on the um, immature neutrophils, you could see from here that uh, this is how the profile looks like. So the symptomatic is the group that we have seen earlier. And uh, obviously, uh, as expected, the asymptomatic uh, group had actually lower cell count of the immature neutrophils. Mm -hmm. And when we went uh, uh, further to also then look at the, um, the other components of this asymptomatic cohort, we did a uh, whole blood transcriptome. And you could see from here that there were actually lots of uh, distinctive immune signatures that were generated. But once again, uh, by looking at um, the two groups with the uh, PCA analysis, they actually separate quite uh, well, uh, uh, distinctively during the acute stage. So how do they look like if you go in depth? So this was the uh, results obtained from the uh, CYTOF panel and also uh, together with uh, some of the cytokines panels, you could see very uh, clearly that uh, the, the patterns look very different from the uh, symptomatic group, as we have explained earlier, and from the asymptomatic group. And it was interesting, you could see from here that the asymptomatic patients actually exhibit more robust virus-specific TH17 response. So I will leave it to Antonio in his next talk to actually show you a more in-depth with the, on the T-cell uh, uh, component of uh, some of these uh, uh, COVID uh, patients. So I'll just move on to another part, which is uh, more related to antibody responses, as uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Paul earlier. So this is just a little introduction, which I believe many of you are very familiar with how the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, structure looks like. Oh, it's a very huge uh, coronavirus of more than 30 kilo base. Uh, but the various uh, uh, viral antigens that uh, people have been really focusing on is pretty much on the spike, as we all know by now. You know, it's not just a very good uh, detection uh, target, but also a vaccine target. But there's also the nucleocapsid that uh, will be uh, fairly interesting as well. Now, in terms of uh, detection, I think we all know about uh, PCR, but that alone is not enough. Right? We will need many other complementary methods, especially the serological methods that will uh, enable us to actually complete the whole story uh, between uh, the asymptomatic patients or people who have been previously exposed before, but perhaps they never got uh, uh, detected in the earlier days. So uh, specifically, I will just home in to one of the particular assay that was um, established by Lohan Rainier and his team, uh, which is a flow cytometry method called the S-flow, because effectively it is um, the generation of the, uh, the S-antigen 
in the lentiviral system that then enable a high throughput analysis of uh, uh, antibodies, specifically IgG or even IgM that is targeted against the spike. So with that, uh, with this assay, it enabled uh, multiple studies out there. So this, uh, they have uh, reported this uh, uh, late last year where, um, again, uh, it's uh, highly specific and also sensitive and uh, they could also follow, using this method, they could actually follow uh, the uh, patient's uh, uh, past uh, uh, for, for, uh, to, to look at uh, long, longitudinal uh, uh, COVID. And uh, currently, uh, this method was also used together with uh, the various members, and some of them are in this, uh, in this room here, actually to, to really go a deep dive in the specific antibody responses from the vaccinated uh, population here in Singapore. And this is just a little bit of an um, uh, introduction here, uh, where um, most, in fact, all of the people who were vaccinated with the vaccine which actually will develop high levels of anti-IgG against the S. So I'll just finish off a little bit with, um, you know, with that, with all the various assays that were then uh, established, how uh, they were used to monitor the, um, the, the vaccine status. And as we all know, a couple of months ago, then the vaccine breakthrough cases uh, um, were reported. I think this was also due to the uh, rise or the spread of the Delta variant, which I think we don't need to go into that. I think there are several talks that have explained that. So uh, we then, uh, the question was actually what happened to this uh, vaccine breakthrough uh, population. So this was uh, done together with, um, I say, the other uh, partners, uh, specifically uh, the, all the various commercial assays that were done by NTHL. You could see from here that uh, in fact, uh, they, they do have high levels of antibody levels. And as I mentioned, um, uh, Lin Fa already explained a little bit from the CPAS uh, uh, component the other day, how the profile looks like. But I would just would like to mention here that uh, using the S flow and how we compare with some of the other assays, you could see that, uh, yes, it's uh, pretty complementary. But uh, the question was on breakthrough, right? So we actually, what it shows here is that uh, when we develop the S flow against um, by using the Delta variant, you could see from here that in fact the vaccine breakthrough cases actually did not have any uh, inferior plasma antibody responses against the wild type and also the del the Delta. But when we went to look specifically into the um, the frequency of the uh, memory B cells. And this is where uh, we found some clear differences. Now, which is our control group? Our control group is the uh, close contact cases. Like I said, people who were living in the same household, but yet did not actually uh, uh, develop uh, the infection. And you could see from here that compared to the um, uh, those people who had the vaccine breakthrough, they had a, a lower uh, frequency of the um, RBD specific memory B cells. So could this be one of the uh, 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 reason that led to the vaccine breakthrough? So I think there are a lot of other questions that are not known. Does age has an effect? I think we are still looking at that together with other members here. So I will just finish off a little bit where uh, by looking at uh, the cytokines again, I think this was always the question that uh, Professor Liu Yixin has always been asking uh, by just using that any difference. So we did uh, the, uh, uh, the cytokines and of those with the vaccine breakthrough, those with close contact and uh, these are the uh, unvaccinated primary infection. These were the people who were infected last year and we compared the analysis. Now what you could see from here using the PCA analysis is that um, clearly the immune signatures of those who went through, uh, who, who, who got infected naturally they had a very different profile from the vaccinated. This is not unexpected. So I think this enable us some early clues to actually go deeper in to understand some of the possible mechanisms of this. So I'll just finish off uh, this last slide. It's, uh, we feel very fortunate that while uh, we had to go through the difficult uh, pandemic, but it also enabled actually many of the researchers to work very closely with the clinical community 
and that enable us to learn about a brand new disease, even though the virus is uh, pretty much, I mean, we know about coronaviruses, but this itself is a different uh, monster. So I, I'd just like to uh, mention that uh, with all the various uh, parts that we put together, it enabled us to, to contribute, not just to the research, but some of these elements also facilitated So, and um, it also enabled us to monitor the uh, immune responses during vaccination and how could we then use all these various platforms, networks to prepare better for the next outbreak. So I would just like to end off, I say it's not, it will not be possible without all the various uh, uh, contributors, uh, close collaborations with the various uh, uh, organizations here. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. So, um, I think we've got a few minutes where we can um, basically invite questions from the audience. And, I'm in person. And, and perhaps whilst um, people are gathering their thoughts, um, I, I, I mean, I can ask something. So, um, Lisa, in terms of these um, vaccine breakthrough um, cases that, that, that you guys have been analyzing, um, Basically, at what point was the, um, the, the this sort of vaccine response um, measured in these individuals prior to them manifesting infection? So, in, in other words, is there, is there a time component in this? Yes, I think that's a very, very good question. So, um, the, uh, uh, the first collection of um, those vaccine breakthrough were upon the time that they were already confirmed a PCR positive. And of course, uh, that alone uh, would not indicate uh, when they were actually uh, vaccinated, right? Because all of them would be vaccinated at different time. But so that the first point would be a, uh, when they were positive. And then we followed them uh, after one month. And also there were the, 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 the subsequent uh, three months as well. So there were different visits that we followed. So if your question is that point, the first point that we show uh, was the time that they were sort of uh, confirmed positive and uh, some of them uh, were vaccinated earlier and some later. Right. But these were all, we only included those who completed the full vaccination. Who had a there full were many who, okay. were, who, was, who actually were in between, so we did not uh, include that group. But the, the, these were principally individuals that got infected um, between sort of one and six months after completing Oh yes, yes, the, yes. The... I mean, not that long. In fact, it was uh, less than six months. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, we have time for one last question. No? Um, I think then, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to thank Lisa for a, a really wonderful and, and, and thought-provoking presentation this morning. And um, we'll move on um, to, to the, the next talk in this morning's session. Okay, thank, thank you. you.